Welcome to PTSD 911 Presents. My name is Conrad Weaver, and I'm so glad you decided to join us today for this program. If you're new to the channel or new to the podcast, a big welcome to you. I want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode. We bring these episodes to you on a fairly regular basis, and when you subscribe, you stay in touch with us and know when we're going to have the, the next show. And uh, you can also feel free to share this with your tribe. If you find this content helpful, please share it with your tribe. So I'm also the producer and director of a documentary film called PTSD 911. It's a story about first responders who are struggling with PTS, PTSI, PTSD, all the things related to trauma in their work. And so we are telling the story through a documentary feature film that will be released later this year in 2022. And we're really excited to bring this to the world soon. If you uh, have not seen our trailer for the film, our promo video, go to our, our YouTube channel or go to our website and check out the trailer. I think you will find it compelling. And if you uh, like what you see and want to help support what we're doing, I encourage you to make a contribution toward our film and toward this podcast as well. So we can continue to bring this content to you at no charge. So today I have an amazing guest with me. Dr. Heather Twedell is in the Dallas, Texas area. And I got to meet her a few months ago when I was down there working with the Garland City Police Department. They introduced me to Dr. T as she's known. And we have a fascinating conversation about her work and in the first responder field. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. T. Well, Dr. T, welcome to PTSD 911 Presents. I'm so glad you decided to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and it's good to see you again. So tell me, well, it's good to see you again too. So tell me who's Dr. T? You're not Mr. T, obviously. No. <laughs> you related different to Mr. Character. T? <laughs> I'm married to a Mr. T, but okay. different one. <laughs> So a little bit about, gosh, who Dr. T is. So my background, um, my doctorate is in forensic psychology, but I specialize in working with first responders and their family members. Um, I'm a first responder family member myself. My dad and brother are police officers. And when I'm newer to Texas, I say newer, um, but I've been here about three years. Prior to that, I lived in California born and raised in SoCal. Um, and I did work for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department when I lived in California. And what was really great there, you know, day one of the academy, uh, making sure that their officers, their deputies were informed just about what the job can, can do to the brain, how on-duty experiences show up off-duty, which I thought was great. Um, and then moving to Texas, I realized, you know, L.A. Sheriff's is fantastic that they can afford to have law enforcement psychologists, mm -hmm. um, but that's 8,000 sworn. And most mm -hmm. smaller departments like my brother and my father's um, can't always afford to have law enforcement psychologists on staff. So really, when I got to North Texas, that's how the name Dr. T came came to you know stand out to these departments, because Twiddell is just a tough one to say. It's butchered. <laughs> so Dr. T it is. Um, but that's really where I developed FIRST, uh, which stands for First Responder Stress and Trauma, and really created a menu of services for these fire and police departments, just really making sure, you know, what do you have in place to make sure that your individuals are informed, that they're taken care of, that they are actively recovered, that their family members are taken care of. Um, and it, it started in August 2020. And since then, um, it's just kind of been this fast moving train and uh, really excited to continue to build the relationships in North Texas. Um, great partnerships along the way. We've just officially partnered with Thorne mm -hmm. for more of the nutrition and supplementation side. Um, and then as well, creating a joint venture with Sports Academy, which we can talk about in a little bit, because I know you got a firsthand experience yeah. there of really making sure the physical component, the performance, the cognitive component is a part of first. So mm -hmm. in a sum, Dr. T is the CEO and co-founder of FIRST, which is this more comprehensive approach to making sure first responders and their family members uh, are taken care of for the sacrifices that they make. Hmm. So the big question for me to start with is why? Why did you decide to, uh, I guess, other than your family being involved in the first responder community, what made you, I mean, go into psychology and then go into focusing in on first responders? 
I think it's two parts. And I think you just kind of touched on both is we'll, we'll start with the professional side, right? Mm -hmm. So the, being a first responder psychologist, um, you know, doing this as many years as I've done this and sitting in as many therapy sessions with first responders that I've sat in, um, I want to always make sure that, you know, we know we're, we've learned so much about the brain even in the last three years. And so as a psychologist, always making sure that these departments are up to speed on research, on the impact of trauma, what works, what doesn't work. And so that was a big push of mine of, you know, making sure that's in place, because I'll tell you, um, it got it got tough just doing the therapy side um, because there's so many first responders that come into my office and it's, there's this feeling that I had, and this was even back in, you know, with the LA County Sheriff's as I sit with these individuals and I feel like, you know what, this didn't have to get this bad. Mm -hmm. um, it should not have even gotten to this point. So there was this, almost this like frustrated part uh, as a psychologist where I'm like, we've got to do more. Mm -hmm. We can't just wait until they're barely hanging on. We can't just, you know, give them some tools in the beginning or, or condition them in the academy and then cross our fingers for the next 20 plus years and hope that they make it to the finish line. So as a psychologist, I felt, you know, we're not doing enough. We have the research, we have the evidence, we know how this impacts human beings. Let's actually put some some healthier and better programming in place. So that's that's what fueled me on the psychologist side. Um, and then on a personal note, personal note, you know, as a family member, Yes, as a psychologist, I have a front row seat to how this job shows up in people's lives. But as a family member, um, I have a front row seat to that as well in my my own family. Mm -hmm. And as a family member, you know, you you're so proud of your loved one for the, the sacrifices they're going to make for wanting to serve their community. Um, but that also comes with, you know, holidays being moved around and birthday parties have to be, be canceled and your loved one having to run out the door because there's a SWAT call out and. Um, you know, you watch those things and then you also watch it slowly take a toll mm -hmm. where um, you hear some of the things they've gone through and then you find out like nothing was done. There wasn't even a debrief. No one reached out. And so as a family member, I got to this point of, again, that frustration of it can't keep going this way. Mm -hmm. um, it cannot keep going this way. So I think combining the like the family member connection piece and what really drives me there with the being a psychologist and knowing that we have access to so many um, programming and so many resources. I just kind of combine those two. And then here we are. Hmm. Wow. I know that the job of a first responder has so many variables and so much in it. And really your response to the traumas, correct me if I'm, if I'm you're wrong, you know, also has to do with your background and what your experience is and what, how you were raised and how your resilience was growing up and all that, that all yeah. plays a role. Right. And so many first responders that I've met, you know, you know, many of them grew up in families that weren't all together. And sometimes they're wanting to get involved in helping others was comes out of that early childhood trauma. So in, in, in your experience, how has early childhood trauma and those other things in, impacted how first responders deal with the traumas that they face? Well, I think what they experienced, you know, as, as a kid or growing up, if some of those things weren't fully supportive or weren't in place in the family unit, not only do I see they want things to be better and healthier and safer for, for, for others. Um, and I think there's also a sense of, you know, departments getting into this line of work. There's also this idea that it's like a family, mm -hmm. like these are your brothers and sisters and it's another family that maybe they can have that connection that they didn't have, uh, growing up. But, um, I will also say that sometimes it doesn't always feel that way mm -hmm. because trauma is a part of it. And now you have this idea to, I want to be a part of this new family. I want to help others. <laughs> But because no one's addressing the trauma piece, um, that can show up in really unpleasant and uncomfortable and unhealthy ways at the departments. Workplace conflict is a, is a huge issue for many first responders. Um, but what I've also seen is if there is trauma walking into this line of career, because this line of this, this career is going to then expose you to really horrific things, um, your brain's going to be forced to have to look at the world differently. The lens is going to change, which, which means your behaviors, your patterns, your mood is going to change with it. But if you're walking into this career with traumas that have not yet been addressed, um, whether that's abandonment, whether that's uh, disappointments from family members, whether that's your own abuse, 
if you haven't addressed those things, it's almost like you're, you're carrying this into this mm-hmm. career. And then we just start piling the trauma, mm-hmm. the threat from this line of work on top of it. Um, and research even shows that, that individuals with trauma in their history, they actually are more susceptible to struggling in this career um, because everyone has a tolerance. So it makes sense they're going to get burnout quicker because they're coming in and everybody comes in with their own stuff, mm-hmm. right? We all have our own stuff sure. in our life, but if there's some significant things there um, that I always encourage, especially in day one of the Academy, try to work through those things before, before mm-hmm. signing up for this type of work. Cause we're only going to add to that plate. Mm-hmm. So when you're working with a first responder, what's the process you take them through to get to a healthy place? First and foremost, education. Uh, that's always where I start is you can't just dive right into how things are showing up in their life and give them some of the school, some of those skills. Um, they have to be informed. And I always say, sometimes I feel like this career is like a bad human experiment where, you know, in any, in any research study, any, in any experiment, you're supposed to go over the risks. And I feel like the only risk they get informed of is you might get hurt or you might die. No one goes into the risk, the risks of how this might impact your life, how this might change things. So I always start with education on just the brain um, and that physiological approach of your brain is an association maker. And the part of your system that turns on the fight, flight or freeze response is going to get a workout with this type of career. And you're going to ask it over and over and over again to be in that mode every time you're on, on duty. Um, and so what goes up must come down, right? You you think of your nervous system like this seesaw. And so when they're at work, you know, that seesaw's up and there's physiological changes, there's chemicals getting released and that allows them to be, uh, efficient, fast, quick thinking, right? Good officer safety, quick to the fire, And that's all great, but then they have to recover. And so the seesaw now comes down and different chemicals get released for that. And it might feel heavy. You might feel detached. You might feel a little bit numbed out. Um, You're recovering from that, right? And so if no one teaches them this seesaw, (laughs) they may not recognize it so much on duty, but where they are going to recognize it is when the seesaw is down and now they're off duty. Mm -hmm. And then who's off duty waiting for them? Their family members. Mm -hmm. And if no one tells their family members these are the things that might look different, um, but there's things we can do to make definitely make it worse and things that we can do to make it more tolerable. If you don't start with education, you're, you're really doing a disservice to every first responder and their family members. At the start. It needs to be at the start of the career. So that's always where I start in therapy. Then if you think of therapy in these like three columns, you have acute stabilization. So you're really targeting the things first that are causing the most impairment in their life. So whether it's like they've started drinking and the drinking's out of control or the depression is so bad or they've not been moving their body and exercising. You do all these things to really start with stabilizing the individual first. Then we get into some of the trauma processing Um, and trauma processing. I will tell I'll tell you no first responder is like excited for that piece uh, because Basically, they've taught their system in order to actually do their job. You know, they can't stop at a call and say, like, holy cow, what am I experiencing right now? Like, what am I seeing? Like, what is this scene over here? The sound of this mother screaming. If they stopped and and paused and actually took that in, it might emotionally overwhelm the system and they wouldn't be able to do their job. So that their system has learned to kind of shelf some of those things and just be more in this survival limbic mode. Problem with that is now the next call comes or the next call comes and then the next call comes or they're tired, they get home and they never come back. And so for 20 plus years, you may have someone who's just like throwing these calls into this treasure box over here, keeping it shut. And and that's not the way trauma works. Trauma doesn't just stay over there. It starts it's intertwined into every part of our being, the way that we think. Um, the way that we function, the way that we respond to our environment and other people. So that trauma processing stage is slowly starting to open that box, which most of them are like, I'm not opening that box. (laughs) I've kept that thing closed. But when, when they realize, you know, it's not closed, it's showing up in their life. And this is important. The reason that we do trauma processing is for new associations, Mm -hmm. right? Because again, the brain's that association maker. So when you are processing a trauma 
we slowly open it up. They call it like the vortex of trauma. And in the session, your body physiologically is supposed to have a response. Mm. But what's different this time around than the first time you experienced it is we get to take that pause. We get to slow things down. We get to use the part of the brain that's actually puts the narrative to it. That part of the brain goes offline when we are in survival mode. Right. And so when you're slowly opening that up and now you're asking the prefrontal to actually get a, a part in the trauma, put words to it. At what point, you know, at this point I felt helpless or at this point I felt alone or at this point I, th I thought I thought I was going to die. Or at this point, I'm really angry because my partner should have done been doing this and this. Right. Now there's more of a narrative. Now we're actually processing the trauma it's not just staying alive in this like survival part of our brain and if we process it differently it means that it gets to get stored differently mm -hmm. right where now after going through processing if you need to talk about that trauma you can take it off the bookshelf open that up and look at it and be able to say it without your system going into this panic mode versus never looking at it it's on the bookshelf but that thing's flying off without even asking you and how it does that could be intrusive thoughts it could be nightmares. It could be being short tempered, irritability, being triggered constantly by your environment. So it's kind of regaining control over the, the trauma. Um, and the more individuals go through it, the more they build that that confidence of like, I get to have a role in this rather than this trauma and this anxiety is just taking over my life. Right. So then once that piece is done, um, then it's just maintenance therapy where they have the skills. They have more awareness, um, things they can do in the moment. They recognize these things. And then maintenance therapy is just, we just check in now. Maybe it's once a month because the thing with this line of work, we know there will always be more calls. There will always be more stress and trauma and threat. Um, we just keep checking in to make sure they're using their skills and they're maintaining. And if they hit another really tough call, they know that first this is their space to come and just process it have the outlet, allow the body to do what it naturally wants to do so that they can go back the next day, you know, and, and do it again. Um, it's a lot of what we ask the human body to do in this line of work, which is why therapy, it's, it's really skills training. It, it's so important that every first responder at least once takes a moment to pause, slow down and have this place of support. Mm -hmm. Man, you know, our brains are amazing. And, so and the work that goes on behind the scenes that we don't even think about, that it separates these things and stores them away. And it's, it's just really fascinating to see and, and to hear about that and to, to learn about that. It's, and how that works is, is just yeah. really amazing. We're pretty incredible beings, <laughs> right? Like it's every situation, every experience, like our brain is constantly taking in its environment and it's constantly doing something with it. It's using it as a compass moving forward. Um, and, but when we're more aware of it, it's, it's less scary or uncomfortable when it's happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I tell first responders, the goal is to never not be triggered again. That's not human. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not likely for them because of all of their experiences, the goal is to be when I'm in a triggered state, can I recognize it quickly enough to then redirect that energy and do something more productive with it rather than getting triggered and not knowing what to do with it. And now it's just it's either bleeding out on family members or it's exhausting my system or it's leading to heart conditions. Um, and this all comes back to that education piece. When you're more informed, you are more likely to be a healthier person. Mm -hmm. So how do you get some of these first responders who are so good at stuffing down their feelings and emotions? How do you get them to kind of bring that out? Yeah, I will say a lot about a lot of what I take pride in with first is about building relationships mm -hmm. first. Right. You have to that trust. build the relationship. Yeah, you have to build the relationship with the chief. You have to build the relationship with the decision makers. And the way that I have found that that just naturally happens is uh, trainings is a huge piece of it. So because a big roadblock for first responders is also like the unknown mm -hmm. of, of what therapy is like. What is it? Is there a couch? Do I have to lay down? Is there weird voodoo stuff like what happens? So that's that's a bigger jump to go from, like you said, stuffing emotions to now you're in that office. Mm. And so training is usually like this this smaller jump mm. where if you bring, you know, if you bring me in and let me just do some of the education and inform them of those things and all of a sudden light bulbs start going off. 
right? And individuals are sitting there and I hear this all the time at trainings. They're like, man, I thought you were talking about me. Or like, did you call my wife? I feel like the things you were saying, like you were talking to me. And that for me, that just validates, you know, using all of the good information we know about the brain and this culture and how it impacts human beings. Once you give that to them, they can put the pieces together rather quickly. And now we have more insight. And then when someone is more insightful, then we have, you know, that moment to think, gosh, maybe, maybe my relationship could benefit from this, or gosh, maybe I I have been short, shorter with my family lately, or maybe I've been more shut down or gosh, I didn't realize that that was because of probably this over here. And now they're putting the puzzle pieces together. They're then they're more excited and more willing and more motivated to then call the number and say, I'd like to come in, um, you know, for some sessions. And I, and I also give them the feedback of, you know, it's not like once you get into therapy, you know, your therapist is like, you're all mine for the next 20 years. It's, you know, it's supposed to be short term. It's supposed to be solution focused. We're supposed to get right to it. Um, so when they realize like, I'm going to come in and actually just work at these things and I'm going to walk away with tangible tools that I can start implementing in my life today, it makes them feel more empowered in their own life. And now therapy, again, just to, gets to become a part of the culture rather than this thing that, you know, we're all hush hush about and only the weak go and seek out. Um, it's not true. It's not accurate. And if you have that mentality that those who think seek therapy are weak, um, you probably just aren't really informed of how the body and the brain works. And that's where let me come in and do a training and, and get your buy in. I really think it takes some strength to do that. You know, it's not weakness. It's, it's a sign of strength that you're willing to go in and really work on the stuff that's been affecting you. Absolutely. I mean, as a human being, if you think right now, like most people, if you said, slow down and think right now, you know, what's something in your life that you could probably be doing a little bit healthier or something in your life right now that you actually don't feel more great about of how you're acting or how most people can answer that question, mm -hmm. but it requires a pause. Mm -hmm. Like they have, actually have to stop and take a moment to reflect and, and say it out loud where that's where the courage comes in that you're talking about. It's not easy to come in and, and sit with yourself mm -hmm. and to sit with some of those secrets or some of those ways that you've thought or some of those things you've done. That's not easy, but that's how we get better. We use all of those experience to say, if I hate the way I did that, or if I feel so much guilt for that decision right there, Let's talk about it so we can better understand, like, how come I acted that way? Why did I make that decision? And then we can look at, OK, what do I need to do different so I never end up there again? Mm -hmm. And again, now we're just building and making you a more self-sufficient individual. Um, and that part feels good. But that starting point of sitting and looking at everything, that takes tremendous courage, tremendous courage. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn about first responders and trauma that surprised you? when you first started working in this field? Uh, what surprised me? It's hard because I'm a family member <laughs> that I'm so connected to like the certain types of personalities that get drawn to this line of work and, 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 and the way that it can impact someone. But I would say something that surprised me, maybe if it was earlier on when I was maybe more green and and many first responders will probably not love to hear this, but first responders do cry and first responders do have a, a very soft side. And, and sometimes I think there's this like macho thing that, you know, they're they're so tough and nothing phases them. And and, you know, they can do the unimaginable and the rest of society is just like there are heroes. Um, but deep down that they're human beings and some of them are actually quite connected to their emotions. They've just never really had that space to release it. And some of that, like you said, could come back to if there is any history of pain um, or disappointment or letdowns in the past, um, you know, maybe not showing emotion is a way that they learned to cope. And once they actually have the space, they are just like everybody else. They're human beings who have their own pains, their own frustrations, their own expectations. Um, and when they connect to that, emotion is there. Mm. It's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this past, uh, well, actually a couple of months ago, I had the privilege of coming down to Dallas and, and spending some time with you and, and seeing 
your work that you do at the Dallas Cowboys Training Center. Uh, why is physical training important in mental wellness? Because the brain, the mind, the body, it's one system. It's one system, right? And so usually when one is healthier, the other is healthier. So if you don't have a healthy body, right? You are less likely to have a healthy mind, the way that you talk to yourself, the way that you address issues. Um, and so if therapy is just a slice of that, right? We're trying to get the way that that inner dialogue, some of the trauma processing, we're taking that angle from it. But if we don't have you, if you then go home and drink and eat unhealthy and isolate and sit in front of a video game for five hours, it, it, it's kind of a wash, right? And so sometimes for for many first responders who don't want to go the therapy route, if we start getting their bodies healthier, their mind will be healthier, right? And we know this with stress exposure. Like if we plucked a piece of your brain, Conrad, right now and threw it in a Petri dish and the way that, you know, the different neurons all communicate with each other in those little roads, those dendrites, if we poured cortisol in that in that Petri dish, what we'd see over time is those dendrites would start to retract, mm. right? And now the roads aren't connecting, which means there can be depression, there can be anxiety, there can be brain fog, there can be memory issues. Um, and when you exercise, when you move your body, when you make sure this thing is healthy, and that includes taking care of your gut. Mm. So how you eat is, is really important too. When you do those things, the brain has this incredible opportunity to rewire itself, to recharge itself. It's called neuroplasticity. And, and the roads go like this again, mm. right? And so your brain is now primed to be able to take on the trauma, the stress, the, the threat that you're asking of it over and over again. Um, if you're not healthy, we're just contributing to that. And then that leads to the mental health issues. The worse the mental health issues, the less likely you are to be a healthy person. And now, and now we have someone who's spiraling, mm -hmm. right? So um, for me, it's that the system is, is one and you have to take a comprehensive approach to all of those things or else, you know, you miss one piece and, and the whole thing might not be able to function the way that it needs to. Mm -hmm. I think many times diet is not always considered as a part of this in so many places. Yeah. And, and first responders, I know that I know that's a challenge to eat well, to eat healthy, uh, you're on the road, you're, you know, at the station, perhaps, uh, sometimes I've been to firehouses and so sometimes what they eat is, uh, it's really, really good, but it's not necessarily the best for you, you know? <laughs> right. and, and so that can be a challenge for first responders. How, how can you, or, or how do you train first responders to, to you know, think better or to take better care of what they eat? Yeah, this and this is where I'm really excited for the partnership with Thorn. Um, and if you don't know who Thorn is, you know, they are top notch nutrition supplementation. They're the only organization that is tied to the Mayo Clinic. So, you know, that you're getting research based scientific, like the most pure supplements that you can get, because um, I think supplementation is an important piece of it because of what you just said. Obviously, what you put in your body, there needs to be training on how much protein and then what you need to help fuel your system. And then after shift, what do you need to give your system to actually help it recover? That's where a registered dietitian is. It's an important part of the team, but also knowing how much stress breaks down the parts of our system. And this is where supplementation is, is really important. So, for example, like at our three day event where we have peer support resiliency training, Thorn is, is a part of that with their registered dietitians to make sure that, again, the education is there. Um, and now with them as a partner, that is just now a part of the whole program where if someone just calls in and says, hey, I, I, I want to get my, my diet under control. What I really like about Thorne is they always start with blood panels. Mm. So they look at first about let, let, let your body tell us where there might be some deficiencies. Let your body tell us where it might be lacking so that we can actually hit the source. And then on top of it, they provide the education. So again, we have an informed first responder who can then go make healthier decisions at home. And that's kind of what I saw as well at the training center and some of the equipment that uh, was being used that day. They were you know, doing different weights or doing different exercises, do even different brain uh, training things that kind of gives them a baseline, right? And so it helps the person know better what, how to work out so they're healthier. 
Yes. And and how did and you get a, and how did you get connected to using that facility and and connecting first responders to that facility there in Dallas? So when I moved to, to when I moved to Frisco um, and started first, my husband, uh, he's a physical therapist. His their clinic was actually within that building. So when we first walked in, when he was going through the hiring process, I mean, you've been there. I looked around. I was like, holy cow, what like what is this place? Mm-hmm. It's like state of the art facility with all these like big, tall athletes walking around. <laughs> and um, and I, I was just mind was blown. And so what was really cool is through through his work and those connections, we were introduced to Sports Academy and the co-founders of Sports Academy, who are great humans, just so easy to get along with, so easy to like. And so as we started having these conversations, um, when I was trying to actually find where am I going to host the first three day peer support and resiliency training, my, it was my husband's idea to say, why don't you talk to Sports Academy? They've got this indoor turf. It's all surrounded by windows. Um, it's a great place to just have a conference. So I thought, OK, so first one happened. The uh, CEO, co-founder, Chad Faulkner of Sports Academy, he would pop he popped his head in to the very first training. And it was like, this is in, this is incredible. Um, and it very much aligns with kind of what we already do. And that's where the tactical athlete discussion started, where we know that Sports Academy, yes, they work a lot with elite athletes, but they also work with like the average human beings mm-hmm. like you and me. Um, but because they work with those elite athletes, you know, my whole approach and many others are as well as first responders are athletes. Mm. They need to be treated as such, right? Their game is their shift. And the difference is, um, and I always joke that until I can get them paid as much as elite <laughs> athletes, I think that they should have access to all the resources that help these athletes go out and put on a good show and put on a good performance our first responders should have access to those same resources so that they can go out and put on a good performance, AKA protect and serve their communities. So that's where that blend first happened. Um, the conversations continued. We all got excited. It's, it's a whole team of different experts and it just made sense of like, we've really got something here that could create a new standard, like really front edge using technology, using research, um, using all these different experts to really put together a program that this first responder who walks in, they're going to be taken care of by a multiple uh, disciplined approach, um, which is really exciting. And I really hope it becomes the standard of wellness across the country, across the world. Like this is the way that we are supposed to be taking care of these people mm-hmm. who do so much for us. Describe why you you consider first responders to be a, a- uh, elite athletes. What are, what are some of the things and the challenges that they have that are unique to their profession that uh, make them an elite an elite athlete? If I can say that word. Yeah. Well, they um, what again? What we ask of their system, just if you go off of physical demands, mm-hmm. uh, is mind blowing to me. Right. So if you think of just starting with gear, average firefighter, that gear is about seventy five pounds added to their system. Um, officers are walking around with utility belts that can be around like 20, 25 pounds, right? So right off the bat, you're already adding extra weight to the body's frame and what that does to the joints and the muscles. So every pound added can be the equivalence of three to four pounds of, of heaviness on the joint, which is insane when you think of, okay, 75 times three or four, like that person's already walking around and their system already has to do that. And that's, they haven't even started the job yet. They're just now <laughs> in uniform. Then they go out and they're holding people. They're pulling on things. They're putting up ladders. They officers go from sitting to foot patrol, like foot pursuit, zero to a hundred. You're asking your system to just call to action, call to action. Oh, and let me add all this weight. Oh, and let me add all the chemicals that are getting released. Um, it's just, it's mind blowing, which is why obviously there's so many injuries in this line of work. And that's really where the exciting piece of having my husband join the team is primarily for that education, for that understanding, that that mindful movement to help with injury mitigation. Because again, this is where that athlete piece comes in, right? We ask athletes to go out and put on all these pads and get hit Mm -hmm. and get up and then do it again. 
that's exactly what is happening for first responders every time they go on shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've seen them, you know, being in the truck and they're jumping out with all their gear, you know, with a with a canister on their back and they're then they're throwing, you know, a big hose on over their shoulder and having to go, and, you know, fight a fire and sometimes do rescues and they're pulling people out of buildings and it's crazy the stuff they have to do, you know, while bounced on a ladder, they're pulling someone out of a building, you know, it's, right. it's, it's unbelievable what they go through. And I can't even imagine, I know what I weigh and to, to add that much weight to my body, then do all these things on top of that is, is right. mind blowing. It's no wonder they have injuries. Right. Well, then if you think even past that, you know, one of those things would be really uh, depleting on the system. Mm. And some of them get back to the station and then like the next call comes right. and now they have to go do it again. Yep. And now this time, maybe it's like a, a pediatric CPR mm. and they just came from a fire and it's like, you haven't even recovered. Your system is like now like, holy cow, that was so hard. And now you're like, nope, let's perform again. Mm. And then we expect it to look perfect. Mm. Right. So they have to go, go, go. And then for officers, they don't get to always come back to a station, right. especially patrol. They have to go do the per the pursuit, do this, and then get back in their patrol unit and then sit for another three hours and drive and be vigilant. Um, it's it is the most I might be biased. I am biased. I think it's the most physically, emotionally, physiologically, mentally demanding job on the planet. And we ask them to do it over and over and over again with without a break. And then you add sleep deprivation to that. Yeah. Which is a whole nother podcast. <laughs> right. You know? I mean, think about how I often think, you know, sometimes like we have a new, we have a new puppy. We figured like, yeah, we just need to add that to our life. So we have a new puppy and we're crate training him. And so obviously he has to wake up multiple times a night. Mm -hmm. It's like having a newborn again. And I was thinking, you know, I wake up that next day and like, I'm going now into work and I need to kind of be in my on mode. And maybe I woke up two times, three times. And all I had to do was just, you know, take him outside, have him go potty, come back in. And I feel like exhausted the next day. I'm like, Oh, I'm so tired. But then you think about what a first responder does. Like they don't just have to, just have to get up and take a little puppy outside. Like they have to get up, do like a full body workout, mm -hmm. chemicals, cascading, go back. If they're a firefighter, maybe try to ask their system to now like get to a place of rest mm. and go to sleep, restful sleep. It's not going to mm. happen, but you think of now the next day, how we feel, that's how they feel. And now they have to either go home and be a parent. They have to go home and, and now there's personal life tasks and duties waiting for them. Again, this is, this is why you have to have a good program in place. Mm. You have to give them the best chance to endure this career because the goal is not just to like get through it it'd be nice if they could keep a marriage mm. or two intact it'd be nice if their liver still worked it'd be nice if they still had a relationship with their children it'd be nice if they didn't have you know a heart attack or two in there y you want to take care of them and then they can enjoy their retirement y you have to have this in place if not because of all these demands you and i are talking about it it's going to impact everyone because they're a human being, mm. not because they're weak, not because they can't handle it. It's going to impact. It's going to take its toll because of their human system, um, which is, again, y you have to have it in place. You have to have a program in place. If not, hello, divorce mm. rates, anxiety, depression, suicide, and all of those rates are way higher for first responders than the general population. And th this is why. Yeah. So how important is it to also include families into this training it's critical. It, it like it has to happen. It's like almost non-negotiable in my in my idea. And what's really cool with some of the departments that I work with here in North Texas is they've really taken they've trusted me with saying like get me into your academy, right? So for example, you know, just the other night come into a department and they're new hires. They're brand new. And they've got their spouse or their boyfriend or their girlfriend sitting next to them. And I come in not to scare them, not to say like, everything's going to change. You guys, probably, you know, half of you probably won't even be married by the end of this. I don't come in and do that, but I come in and I give them information so that they can be an informed unit so that when it does show up in their relationship, because it's going to, because it does for everyone, they will say, okay, here it is. We, we were given a heads up that this might look this way, 
that this might happen this way. Here it is. Let's stay on top of it. Let's not let it get out of control. Let's implement our skills, Mm -hmm. right? Because this doesn't just impact the one person. And that goes for trauma across the board, first responder or not first responder. Trauma impacts everyone Mm -hmm. around the person who is actually traumatized. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a really good program in place to keep your first responder healthy and you are not considering about the ripple effect it's going to have, those ripples will then cause stress on the first responder. And then you, you're going to have issues there as well, too. Healthier home life, healthier on duty life Mm -hmm. and vice versa. So you have access to the sports academy. And and what about those individuals who don't have access to an elite facility like that? How can they really work on their physical body to be able to get to you know, where it's optimal. Right. I think if you take the components of our program and find out who your local resources are, make sure that you have access to a mental health provider, psychologist, therapist, whoever it is, make sure that they're culturally competent and start having conversations and let them help you with that piece. Find out who's around you in your your neighborhood. If you're a smaller department, maybe there's a local gym. There's usually a human performance coach that's associated with that. Sometimes they have dietitians at at those gyms. Learn about what's accessible to you. Utilize your resources, but make sure you're having this comprehensive approach to it. Um, And if you're saying like, well, we don't have that or we've tried it and it's just still not still not working. I mean, the bigger goal of, of, of first is to scale out to help create that national standard. Um, or like I said, even a, a across the world, but so we are working on solutions that are scalable and that includes technology that includes an app, um, that includes mobile trainings. Another thing that I do is something called wellness checks, where it's not a therapy session. It's not a fitness for duty evaluation. I'm not assessing anything. I basically am doing a 30 minute check in um, and I have a team of 10 therapists that I've also vetted and trained as well. It's a 30 minute check in that includes a little psychoeducation. So a little information about, hey, this is this is how on duty can show up off duty. And then we can look at, are there any concerns or does any of that sound familiar? And if it does, what are you currently doing? Uh, Is it working? How do we know it's working? If it's not working, here's some other tools. Um, So it's really this check-in so that once a year, the first responder can have that pause that they don't often take. And because it's not therapy, because it's not, um, you know, it's not in that therapeutic world, it's more of that wellness check. Most individuals can do this. We can cross state lines. So other other departments from like, let's say different states who have reached out to first, um, let's say somebody in California is like, I would like a wellness check for my department. You can set that up and it can all be done remotely. So, of course, I always like in-person interactions, but if it's if it's our ability to bring support to a department that may not have access to someone in person, we can do a 30 minute Zoom, a 30 minute check in. And now the chief the department can kind of check that box of knowing, OK, one at least once a year or at least just checking in and making sure that they have the pause and that they're informed. So a lot of different ways that FIRST is hoping to grow, scale, um, and we're also hoping to pick up FIRST and put it in a few other locations as well. But that's big picture right now. Uh, we're here in North Texas. Mm-hmm. What is going to happen with first responders who are in a department? Their leadership perhaps isn't on board with some of that. They still have that mentality to just rub some dirt on it. How how can you help begin to change that mindset in a, in a leader, in a, in a department? I always say like, let me talk to your crustiest, most resistant person at the department. And if that's your chief or if that's someone up the chain, if you can get me in front of your leadership team and I will bring my team members with me. And we have a nice way of just basically laying it out so that it's almost like you can't argue it because this is the way the human system works. This is the way the brain works. Um, You can't really argue it. So it's like we give them just enough to where basically if you walk away from that conversation and you're like, no, we're good. Like our, our people don't need anything like that. That's that's really sad. And honestly, it's negligent. Um. I would hope that if you are watching this or if you're listening and you you are someone who has impact within your department, start talking around because that's another thing that maybe going back to the question when you asked what surprised me, 
is that yes, there's a stigma, but it's, it's moldable. It's it, we're changing it. And when you find like one first responder at a department and you have their buy-in and they're like, yeah, I, I want to make my department healthier. Um, that has, I think, surprised me the most is there are motivated first responders out there. And when you connect them with the right people or you add to that motivation with maybe two or three of their peers, I have seen departments make complete changes because of a few just really fired up individuals who are like, enough is enough. Mm. So if you're at the very top, I hope that you're open. I'd love to have a conversation. Mm. If you're not at the top of that chain, don't lose hope because you you can make mm. a change here and reach out to your other departments who are successful with those changes. That's one of the things I love at the three-day peer support um, and resiliency training is it's about 20 plus departments from North Texas who come about 70 fire and police. And I have a panel where it, they're different, like peer coordinators. They're different individuals who have made positive impacts. You put them all on one panel. Then you let people ask questions like, well, how'd you get this in the budget? Or how'd you get, you know, your chief to say yes to that? Or how'd you get around people who didn't want to do it? And they are just a plethora of information. Um, for me, that's what's really exciting to sit back and just watch them talk amongst each other, because I think that's how we change the culture. You let the people who are actually on the front lines, who actually are experiencing this firsthand, let them tell the stories, let them demand why this is important. And I'll just come in and kind of give the additional information of like, yeah, what they said, and this is why. Mm -hmm. So can you share a story of a first responder that you guys work with, obviously, without revealing who it was or that kind of you know personal information, a story that inspires you to keep doing this that motivates you to keep say wow this is why i do this gosh i mean honestly i will say every one of my clients um i see about 26 first responders a week and those aren't the same 26 right so um since starting first has a little over 3000 therapy sessions under its belt i will say every human being that i sit with in a therapy room is my reason to keep doing what i'm doing and when I hear things like, you know, this has changed my life or this has made me a better father or I'm now a better spouse because of this or I'm not feeling as depressed or, hey, I started walking again and I just walked like two, two miles yesterday and my wife and I are now walking. Every single one of those stories is what fuels me to continue doing this. Um, we do have some of those, you know, other stories on a, a bigger scale since since the um, joint efforts between sports academy and first where now we're seeing the physical side so we had you know uh, an individual who was struggling with weight and was struggling with some of the performance and the peers you know were even kind of questioning can this can this first responder still do the job and rather than just you know throwing a fitness for duty evaluation at him or considering firing him um, because the job led to some of those health issues Rather than doing that, the department looked to us and said, OK, what do you got? And we said, give us three months. Look, give us three months and let us put our program in place for this individual and, and let us show you that we can make an impact here. And this individual has already lost a significant amount of weight, is already scoring higher on depression and anxiety scales, um, lower on depression, anxiety scales. Symptoms have lifted. Um, relationships are improving. And command staff is reaching out to me saying, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Cause this person has like a different energy, um, smile on their face. And, and that is also what fuels me knowing that we can, we can make individuals healthier. And that's also a way for us to say, thank you for the work you've already done. I see how it's showing up in your life. Now let us help you with the way that it's shown up. That for me is just that's what they deserve. They don't deserve to be punished or pulled off work or fired because the job caught up. They deserve to be taken care of. And that's truly what I feel that we're doing here at first. I know in your line of work, there can also be a thing called compassion fatigue. How do you stay healthy as a provider? Good question. My first responders ask me this all the time too. Um, honestly, I do all the things that I preach in the therapy room. Um, movement for me is big. So luckily enough, my husband and I, we, we love running and my kids are still at the age three and six where I, I can push them in a stroller. It's, it's heavy. Um, but having those like knowing when I get home at the end of the day and I'm just, you know, maybe I've had eight hours of 
therapy sessions and trauma processing. And, and I know that I'm either like kind of feeling quiet or I'm just feeling heavy. I know that, um, A, I can say whatever I need to with my husband. So I, the same way I tell first responders, like say it out loud. That's part of the processing. Like if you're sitting with it, even if you don't know what it is, just say out loud, like, Hey, I'm in a funk or I don't know what I need. Any ideas, share it with the people who love you because they can help you through it. And so my husband is an incredible support, as is my whole family um, of first responders. Right. So they see it. They understand it. So we check in on each other often. Movement is in there. Um, spending time, like actual time with my children, putting the phone down. Um, it's hard to do this day and age to be present. And especially, you know, building up first and all the exciting directions it's going. I can sometimes get home and I'm still doing this. Um, and it takes this intentional awareness. And sometimes my husband has to call me out on it of like, let's just slow down for a minute. Like, let's just actually sit and like get on the ground and play with the kids, get down and play, like take the puppy for a walk. Um, sometimes people think mental health have to be these like big things or like, oh, go take a vacation. And those things help, but it's it's the day to day. So it's little it's things that add up both positive and negative, right? Yes. And if you are a, an aware person, um, and I, I try, I like to think of myself as pretty aware of myself. I try to pay attention to my body will let me know what I need. Um, if I am feeling a certain way, I, I know that I have to do something. Um, and sometimes just stopping and just paying attention, you know, can go a long way. So I, I really try to do all of those things for myself, drink some water here and there too, <laughs> right. Try to eat healthy. Um, but yeah, even on the tough days where I'm struggling, first responders, there, these are some incredible men and women that I have the honor of just providing support for and walking in their journey with them. And that, again, even on, even on my tough days, I get that reassurance of like, we are doing something that is so important and we got, we got to keep going. But I also take breaks and take rests when I need to as well. I would love to talk to you about the equine therapy that you do, but we'll save that for another podcast at some point. Okay. Uh, but I do yes. want to ask you this. What's something that a first responder can do now? Perhaps they're seeing this and you know what? I need to make a, a first step toward, you know, getting either physically healthier, mentally healthier. What What's something they can do now to, to begin that process? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think if you are a first responder who's listening to this, that pause is the first thing that we can do, right? If I can slow down and, and pen to paper is really helpful for this. If you can pause long enough and I tend to be like, I like visuals. So on that piece of paper, maybe you draw like a little stick figure and that's you. And then around that stick figure, draw all the areas of your life that require attention, require energy and, and see those things, right? And then just take a moment and kind of see what your brain does with that information. And usually it maybe will come to this box and say, okay, what's going well? And how could this box be improved? Okay. Maybe it's um, going to church, right? Maybe the next box is parenting. What's going really well? Give yourself credit. And then look at like, well, what, what could be improved, right? I could probably identify something. How am I going to get there? So if you stop today and just start looking at the things, the areas in your life that that want time with you, that require time with you, that are critical and make sure in those boxes, your self-care or your health is one of them, right? Now that we have kind of a visual, it's more easier to make an action plan of, okay, this is actually going well, but I could probably start taking walks. I could probably start adding in a walk or two, at least, you know, in a week's time, or I could probably start, um, not drinking so much alcohol and maybe instead of the alcohol, maybe I sit in the backyard with my kids instead, right? These little shifts, these little intentional moments, that's how we get healthier. If you sit there and you look at your box and you're like, I am not doing well. A lot of the boxes in my life are actually suffering. Or when I ask what's going well, if I'm having a hard time coming up with what's going well, please reach out. Um, therapists aren't there to tell you how to live your life. They're there to help you put the pieces together, to encourage and to let you work through it and get to the solution on your own. Please reach out. I promise you therapy is not as terrible. It's not as scary as you think. Yes. Some of the offices have couches. No, you don't have to lay down on them. You can sit. Right. But, um, that's what I would encourage to most first responders today. Mm, that's great advice. Thank you for that. So yeah. if someone wants to get, get in touch with you, your organization, how can they do that? 
Yes. So right now with the joint venture, our website is getting like a complete facelift to reflect all of the new services, but you can still, you can still visit it. And um, it is the old website. The new one should be going live hopefully in a, a week or two, but that's www.first and first is spelled with the number one instead of the letter I uh, dash tx.org. Um, if you're interested in a training or coming to our three day event or having us come to you, uh, there's the like more of the business line. And let me make sure I have this correctly. 469-525-6482. And if you are deciding, you know what, I'm actually, I want to reach out for therapy. I think this would be helpful. That's a different number. That's 469-352-7491. Super. Well, thank you so much for yep. your time, for your expertise, and just for your willingness to get on the show today and to, to talk about these important things. And, and thank you for your work with first responders. Thank you, Conrad. And can I just say, as someone who, you know, as a family member and someone who works in this line of work, um, I really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate all the sacrifices you've made probably over the last few years to, to get this message out there and to connect with these human beings who so much deserve it. Um, I just really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for, for what you're doing. Well, it's my privilege and you know we have to do something to help our first responders. And so it's my privilege and honor to do that. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much for sticking with us to the end. I really appreciate it. If you found this content helpful, please hit the subscribe button and then share it with your tribe. Let other people know about this program. We're going to bring you another one soon. So stay tuned and be well, take care of yourself. And I'll talk to you again soon.